Hey guys, what's up? My name is Gabe and this is Games with Gabe and this is the next episode in the Game Engine Concepts series. So this one's going to be a relatively short one because it's not that difficult of a concept, but it is, once again, like all of these patterns, pretty profound in the results you can get from it. And this is something that Bob Nystrom calls the state pattern. And you may have heard this as another term, something called an FSA or a finite state automata. Now, all this is, is it's a fancy word for saying it's some circles with some arrows, okay? Basically, this is something called a, it eventually builds into something called a Turing machine, which is basically Alan Turing's suggestion for if you can make this, then you could theoretically make a machine that could do anything, which is our general purpose computer, right? It's a machine that can do basically anything. But anyways, this is the building blocks to that, and it's just something simpler called the finite state automata. And... Uh, the real basics that you need to know about this is basically you have states, right? So we could start, call this state A, we could call this state B, and we could call this state C. And then what we say is, I'm going to remove this arrow just so that we have no confusion. We would say, okay, go to A on 0, go from B to C on 1, go from C to B on 0, go from B to A on 1. And basically what you would do is say um, this was your start state, right? And then you had some character literal or whatever the states went like this all that would say is okay so we're starting at a and then where would we end up well we hit zero so then we're at b then we hit a one so we're at c we hit another one so if we wanted to be really good we would say if we hit another one we'll stay at c we hit a zero we go to b we hit a one we go back to a and then we hit a zero we go back to b and this would be our final state so then we could just say like using this set of state inputs we would end up at b Okay? And when it's this abstract, it really doesn't help you out that much. And so I like to think of this in a much more friendly terminology, right? So Unity actually implements these uh, in their animations, right? They use state machines for their animation. So in Unity, you could have something like a walk animation. And then when uh, the user triggers some trigger, right? You could have like a run trigger, right? And so when the run trigger gets hit, then it goes to the run animation. And then if they hit like super run trigger or whatever, then you go to the super run. Then if you go from super run back to run, you would go back to the run trigger. Or you could say if you go from super run and you hit walk, you could add another connection in here, but that wouldn't look good. And so that's the whole reason for the state machines. Basically, we're saying, okay, if we want to go from this state to this state, we have to first go back into a running state. Then we go back into a walking state. That way the animations transition smoothly. However, this does not need to apply to just animations, okay? It can apply to games as well, and it should apply in your games and your game mechanics. So the easiest place to see this in action is with a player object, right? And so typically you have some player, and this player might have a jetpack, right? And so using this jetpack, the player can fly, but when the player's on the ground, then they're just running. So they're doing a whole different set of actions. And basically, the logic for when they're flying is completely different than the logic for when they're walking, right? Because basically, if they're flying, we would want to be checking a certain set of parameters, whereas if they're walking, another set of parameters. Another case where the state pattern would apply very well is with AI. So if you want simple AI, where basically you have, you know, your Goombas or whatever you have, uh, they're on patrol if there's no player. So they just walk back and forth in their patrol state. But then uh, if they see a player somewhere over here, then they switch to the angry state. And so they put on their angry eyes and then they're running after the player. And so then they're in chase state until they lose the player. Then they go back to patrol state. And so basically you can use state machines for these too. How would a state machine for something like this work? Well, it's very much the same. So basically say your player has a couple of states. They have their flying state, right? And I actually use this for my geometry dash. We'll look at that code in a minute, but I use something like this to help me manage states and everything. And then we'll have our ground state, okay? So flying state, they're in the air, ground state, they're on the ground. Basically what we say is on, uh, when the user releases the A button, whatever that may mean, okay? You could have some input binding and whenever that happens, we transition from flying to ground and we transition from ground to flying whenever the user presses the A button. So as long as the A button is being held, we are in the flying state. Otherwise, we're in the ground. And this doesn't actually make that much sense. We'll say instead of when they release the A button, this is more of like an indirect transfer of states, right? So basically, um, player hits ground, 
and then they're in the ground state, okay? So as you can see, the state transitions don't have to be a specific user input or something. It can be something more abstract. You just have to make sure you transition the state appropriately, okay? And then let's say there's also swimming in the game. So we'll add in a swimming state. Now you can go from flying to swimming, uh, but that only happens when the player hits water, right? You can go from a ground to a swim state also. That only happens when the player hits water. Now you can see where this starts to have some cool stuff. Because basically, if we're in a swim state, when we press the A button, we don't want to just start flying. And that's fine. We won't just start flying because basically we will stay in the swim state until we're not in the swim state, until we're back to the ground state. So then we can add a transition here and we'll say player hits ground. And this ensures that while the player is swimming, the A button means they swim, they bob up and down. But if they're on the ground and they hit the A button, then they start flying. And so just using these states to encapsulate whatever state the player actually is in at any given moment, we can include different logic for these. And we make sure that transitioning between these different states is easy. Without this, you end up getting a big blob of mess with switch statements and all sorts of garbage. And if you look at Bob Nystrom's article, he sort of so shows that. And then he shows how it can be simplified using the actual state pattern. So now that we know what the state pattern is, let's just take a little look at some of my codes that you guys can see what it looks like in action. All right, so what we're looking at here is basically just a some code from my geometry dash series. I don't know if I actually got to this point in the series, but uh, inside the code, I have this integer and it's just called state and it literally represents the state the player is currently in. Now you could also implement this and I would actually suggest that you do implement this as an enum. So you could say something like private uh, enum state and then I, you can name it. So then you could say flying and or in this, in this case, I guess it's spaceship and regular. That way you can do, you know exactly what you're doing. You're not just dealing with some number. So using the enum, I would say in all cases instead of a number, but a number works just as well. That is all an enum is. Then if we go down to the update method, we can see that we basically say um, down here is where it sort of gets important. So I basically just say if state is zero, update regular state. Otherwise, if state is one, update spaceship state, right? Because zero is the regular, one is the uh, spaceship. And this brings with it some interesting stuff because when we're in the spaceship, we can fly. And so I have a whole different set of logic that uses a lot of key bindings that are the same as inside the regular state. But inside the regular state, we call different methods than we do inside of the spaceship state. So it's really nice. You can just encapsulate all of that logic inside of the appropriate state. And once again, you may already be using this. It is a very common pattern but it's good to know exactly what it is and how to use it. I'll go over another example that I have that's a little bit more fleshed out than this. All right, so this is in the Mario game that I created as part of like the Jade Engine series and everything. But basically, I did a little bit more of a complex state machine in this, and it's actually a state machine. So you will probably recall if you've ever used Unity, they're animation machines, and I was modeling it based off of that. So basically, inside of this animation machine, I have a list of animations, which are the different states. You can think of them as the same thing. Then I have the current state that I'm on, and then I have a string representing like state transitions and everything. And so basically you create this animation machine and then you can add animations to the animation machine and then you can also add transitions. And the transitions are actually encapsulated within the animation. So if we go into the animation, you'll see that this basically just has all the animation logic and then it has this thing called state transfers, which is a map from a string to a string. And so basically the state transfers are just ways for it to say, okay, if I'm in this state and I get this trigger, then I'll switch to this state. And then you'll see that I actually have this uh, trigger which basically just takes in a string and it says if we have that state that we can actually transfer to, then we'll literally just uh, return a new animation. And then it basically encapsulates all that logic. But it's a little bit more of a complex example of the same thing, showing that you can use this in a little bit more of a complex way to get a more generic version of this that you can use in a lot more ways. And so you can see that I actually use this. I think I have it in the Goomba AI. So I actually have one of these inside the player controller. So you'll notice I have an animation machine inside the player controller. And if we go down to where we actually transition the animations and stuff, you'll see that basically, um, okay, so right here, I have basically a whole bunch of different things. So you'll see that I have this if do win animation. And then I basically say, if we're sliding down the pole and if we're triggering the slide animation, then I just say machine.trigger start slide. And this changes my whole animation, everything. 
And then I have this else. And then I basically say, if we're doing this, then we're going to start running and all sorts of different stuff. And you'll notice that I use it in quite a variety of places. This would be a perfect place too, by the way, <laughs> to not only use the state machine as part of my animations, but also to abstract a lot of this code. Because you'll see, this is what it looks like when you're not using the state machine. Then you get all of these if statements, which are really horrible, just because you don't know what to do when you're going from state to state. So this is the perfect place where I could have used it, and I didn't, and then I used it for the animation. So this just goes to show that if you use it in the appropriate places, you can really abstract your code and make it a lot cleaner. I would like to do that to this to show you guys the difference, but I don't feel like doing that right now. Uh, this about covers it for this tutorial, though. State machines are very simple. They don't have to be complex like this. Uh, you can literally do what I showed you in the geometry dash version, where it's just a number, and you basically just have an if branch. But you can make it more complex, and the more complex you make it with the more genericized version of this, it does give you a little bit more flexibility. That's it for this tutorial, though, guys. I am going to mention that next week I will not be able to release any tutorials because I won't be having the time next week to do that. But I'll try and release one on Saturday as well, uh, which is probably going to be tomorrow from when this is released. So uh, look forward to that one. And if you guys like this, please hit like and subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Thanks.